said that we get like such a very diverse audience. We get people from all over the world. Um, you know, with this virtual setting, it's, you know, sometimes it, it, it has its own challenges, but I think the reward is that we get to meet so many new people. And, uh, and I'm glad that we all get to meet and talk about uh, one of my favorite plant groups. Um, so uh, Benny and I, we are actually based um, in, the, in the San Francisco Bay area in California, um, primarily in the South Bay. So um, we actually work for an agency called the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, um, which is a government organization that helps to protect um, working lands, uh, water resources, and wildlife habitat. And a big part of our mission is also connecting people to nature. Um, so that's why we put on these educational programs. We wanna encourage folks to get out there, uh, learn a little bit more about um, the natural environment that surrounds them. And we're uh, just some of the amazing evolutionary uh, life history of ferns. It, it blows your mind. Um, it blew my mind in college. It's something that I keep coming back to. It's something that I have to keep relearning because I'm like, ferns are not like other plants. They don't do the same thing reproductively. So we'll get to, we'll, we'll get to go over that. Um, so to help you understand ferns, um, it's best to kind of keep, uh, keep them in view of um, how they relate to other plants. Um, so that's why I have a cladogram here. Uh, this is from the US USDA. And it lumps them in with horsetails. Um, and as you can see, they are actually um, derived from club mosses, quillworts, and then um, a little bit further back is mosses and liverworts. Um, so the way I like to think about it with the story of plants on earth, we first had the single celled organisms about 1 billion years ago um, start to form. These single celled organisms had chloroplasts. They had, um, there was actually a symbiotic relationship between a chloroplast and a eukaryotic organism. Anyway, it was a partnership. So those single celled organisms could photosynthesize. And that's how we define the first plants. Um, move forward about 500 million years ago, around 470 uh, million years ago, we um, actually see the first land plants. So, you know, because these single celled organisms were in the ocean, there's a lot of competition for space. You can only stay in this first few feet of the ocean to photosynthesize. You get much deeper than that, you're not gonna get um, enough light to photosynthesize. So um, there was a lot of push um, between you know, the competition part and also um, because of herbivores in the ocean, right? You have animals um, that drove some species to find a better niche, you know, to find an empty niche and land was that niche. So that's when we start to see mosses and liverworts. Um, and as we will see in the next slide, um, the life cycle and habit, uh, habits um, between mosses, liverworts are kind of similar to their uh, later um, progeny, the, the ferns and the, and the fern allies. So we'll get to see a little bit of that. So, the biggest thing that you gotta remember is what differentiates mosses or what differentiates um, ferns from their predecessors um, is that you actually start to see roots. Um, these mosses, they come onto land, but as you, as you all probably have seen mosses, they're only like so tall and um, that's a limitation based on the fact that they don't have roots and they don't have vascular systems. So they don't have the, the ability to move and shuffle nutrients um, to their different cells. It's done mainly through osmosis. So it's actually really difficult for something that's using osmosis to grow very tall. They can't, they can't grow very tall at all. 
um, ferns were the first things to develop this, you know, kind of um, to evolve this first thing called um, vascular tissue. So they get stems, they get like actual uh, differentiated, you know, leaves and stuff, and they get roots, which is really important um, for getting taller. Um, and in fact, um, that would have been around 270 million years ago during the Carboniferous era, you start to see these giant forests of club moss trees and they reached over a hundred feet tall. Um, we actually see the first fossil evidence of ferns in the Devonian, which is a part of the Carboniferous um, around 250 million years ago. And that makes them some of our most ancient plant groups. Now, the way that I think about this in terms of us is Carboniferous, that era um, produced a lot of the coal and oil that we actually use to burn today. So when you think about like when you're driving your car or, you know, back in the old days when they had like coal burning furnaces and things, you were actually burning ancient ferns. Isn't that pretty cool? I mean, you think about it in terms of climate change and all of that, I mean, not super cool, but still we're using something that has been around for eons. And just the magnitude of that, just like it hits me every time. So um, one thing that I did want to mention too is um, recent genetic evidence um, lumps horsetails and ferns into a more closely related group. They, it was at one point, um, people didn't realize that they were very closely related, but in fact they are. They both um, use spores to reproduce, the same as actually mosses and liverworts um, and other lycophytes. So um, that they actually use a very similar reproductive strategy. So I did want to mention that um, horsetails are another favorite plant of mine. Um, Equisetum, they're also called scouring rushes. So you often see them near streams and um, people used to use them for actually like washing things. That's why they're called scouring rushes because they kind of have a rough texture to them. Um, but I have a quick question regarding that slide. Um, we have folks asking if that's 100 meters or 100 feet. 100 meters. 100 meters. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I may have misread it. I saw the M and, you know, me being the American here, have to, you know, <laughs> update everything. Thank you for calling me out on that. I should be better about that. Um, 100 meters tall. So before I actually get into some of the biology, um, I do want to also mention um, fern anatomy. Um, so it's, it's good for us to kind of get a template as to what, what composes a fern before we talk about their biology and talk about like their life cycle because their life cycle is um, actually kind of um, complicated to, yeah. So, um, the fronds are what you call the leaves, you know, so when you're thinking about a regular plant, you're thinking about a leaf, like say a sycamore, for, for example, or an oak leaf, it's, it's this composite thing, it's flat, it, um, it photosynthesizes, it has veins coming out of it, um, and it's attached to a stem. Um, so the same definition applies here, uh, a frond is a complete leaf. So the leaves are actually basically coming out of the ground, out of a rhizome. Um, and we call these leaves compound pinnate, um, which essentially just means that uh, pinnate uh, comes from the word pinna, um, which, which means feather or fin. Um, so it's usually uh, something, it's, it's Greek actually, it, means something that has like a midrib and radiating things coming out of that uh, one line. 
Um, so as you can see in this image right here, you have a frond. It has little leaflets that come out of the frond along um, an axis. So uh, the pinna are the uh, pinna are the leaflets. So um, in this section, you can see, you know, they're the pieces of the leaf that are coming off. And a lot of plants have this uh, type of um, leaf anatomy, uh, this leaf morphology. I can think of a couple like yarrow, for example, um, or even some, some of your basic pea plants kind of have a similar uh, leaf structure. But um, essentially, it's you know having to do with um, these little smaller pieces of leaf that could be an individual leaf. But um, what makes the leaf the leaf is the fact that it has a stem. It has a petiole. So um, in a fern, that's called a stipe. And then on the underside of the fern, you have uh, spore producing sporangia, which are arranged in sori. So um, you're not gonna really see it during this time of year, especially here in California. Um, you're gonna see them later in the year, usually around summertime um, when things are starting to dry out. And that's when the sori mature um, and that's when the plant is ready to release spores. Um, and, you know, ferns are very different than our previous plant families. That includes um, the mosses in that they have roots. You may have pulled, you know, mosses out at one point and realized, oh, no, they have these like little things sticking out of them. Those, those aren't roots. Um, forgot what they're called. They're so called something different. Um, but that just anchors the moss in place. It doesn't actually uh, transport nutrients or anything. Um, in a fern, it serves its purpose um, in absorbing moisture from the, um, from the soil and transporting that throughout the plant. Um, and I'm going to mention again, but uh, ferns, they reproduce sexually, which we're going to talk about, um, but they also reproduce asexually through um, rhizome, rhizomatic division. So you can, if you're propagating them, for example, you can um, dig them up, uh, break up the rhizomes and plant them separately and they will um, reproduce that way. Um, and that's asexual, doesn't require, um, doesn't require the transfer of spores or anything like that. I feel like I'm running really fast. Oh boy. All right. So this is my favorite part. This is going to be my favorite part out of this whole presentation, except maybe maidenhair ferns and goldback ferns, because they are my favorite ferns. But um, so ferns, they have a very different life cycle than what we kind of expect from a lot of other plants. Um, when you think of a general plant, like I like to think of a pumpkin or corn or you know something delicious that I eat. Um, I'm usually thinking of, uh, you know, an angiosperm. It's something that grows from a seed, grows up, produces a flower, um, and that flower gets pollinated uh, with pollen. Uh, the pollen sticks to a stigma, which um, that process of fertilization then produces a fruit uh, and seeds. And the difference is with ferns is they actually have two different life stages, um, two independent life stages. Um, so in the fern life cycle, you have the sporophyte, which is the leafy thing that you commonly see in the forest when you're walking along and you see this leafy lush thing um, coming up out of the ground. That is usually the sporophyte. Um, and it's pretty big. It's pretty noticeable. The sporophyte produces the spores. So at the end of the season, it's getting dry. Um, that sporophyte produces spores. 
which get carried by the wind um, to find suitable locations um, to land. Of course, it has no control of where, where it lands, but hopefully it lands somewhere really moist, really wet. They, that's why a lot of ferns like to stick around um, moist and like uh, wet forests, tropical forests. Um, they like to stick around stream banks and, and that kind of thing. They like shade because it shade tends to be um, more wet. It stays wet for longer. Um, uh, so that spore is going to land somewhere. Hopefully it lands somewhere suitable, somewhere wet. And the spore actually uh, produces a little plant, and that's called a gametophyte. Um, and I think it's really appropriate that we're talking about gametophytes in the month of February because they look like little hearts. Um, and they're not, you're not very likely to find them. They're very hard to find um, because they're like less, less than the size of your pinky nail. They're so small. Um, but this little gametophyte is basically its own little independent plant. Um, but what's different is that it's haploid. So it's producing um, gametes that, you know, it has the antheridium and the archegonium, which are really technical terms, but basically the sperm and the eggs. And those are all haploid. And what's usually going to happen is like, because this gametophyte is growing in a wet medium, um, it's hopefully got some other um, gametophytes growing near it. And um, the antheridium, uh, the, basically uh, the sperm coming from that is going to be finding new gametophytes to fertilize the archegonium. And when that happens, um, you'll actually see a new sporophyte grow out of this um, gametophyte. It's, it's wickedly cool. Um, I, when I first learned this in college, I was like, what? How does that work? And you have so many questions usually, like, well, how, how do they do that at all? Like if it's not like super, super wet, you know? Honestly, it's a mystery to me how they, how they manage to do that, but they, they're able to do that. Um, the sporophyte actually grows out of this gametophyte and then the life cycle starts over again. So that sporophyte will grow up big, produce spores again once it's mature and the cycle goes on. Um, and I think this is, this is not something that I've um, researched extensively, but um, ferns will uh, make decisions depending on the local conditions. So, you know, if you have a pretty wet year, um, you're gonna, you know, if you put out um, the spores for that year, you're gonna, you're probably gonna do well. Honestly, if it's not a wet year, like in California, for instance, we didn't start getting our rains until February. You're probably going to just stick to your usual rhizomatic divisions um, to reproduce um, if you reproduce at all, just because um, you got to take a chance with that sexual reproduction. And you know, sometimes the conditions might not be right for you to do that. And we're going to talk about a few ferns um, that. Honestly, it boggles my mind, like how they're able to do this because they live in actually really dry conditions. So anyway, I'm gonna take some questions before we move on because uh, the next few slides are gonna actually talk about specific ferns. Yeah, we so, did have one question from Miles and he was asking what would be a suitable surface for the gametophyte? So, that is a good question. Um, usually, so it's, it's an interesting thing to hypothesize about. I'm not entirely sure I know the exact answer to this question, but if I was a gametophyte, I'd like to land um, on either a wet log or near some rotting kind of detritus 
a, a puddle would be great um, because then you have a lot more moisture to work with. Um, some tree hollows would be good. I know I've seen I've seen some ferns grow in tree hollows and on rotting um, rotting logs, for instance. I've seen them grow um, even even on rocks like boulders. And I can imagine how like during the rainy season, some of these crevices in the forest they fill up with water. And those might be some really good places for you to grow as a gametophyte, because then you can, um, you know, you and some other gametophytes can hang out for a little bit and um, get your business done. So, yeah, that's that would be my best hypothesis. Um, some of them really like more uh, stream type areas. So, you know, for year round kind of reproduction and more consistent sexual reproduction, you could definitely see like different pools around streams might be actually really good wet areas for ferns to reproduce. That's a good question. Thank you for answering that. We have another question from, from Kevin. If I save fern spores, how long before I see a mini baby true fern leaf? Oh, that is a good question. I'm not sure um, how to propagate spores. Um, if you go and you talk to some of the, the like the real experts who know how like really how to do this, man, they uh, there are some people who are like looking and trying to get viable spores over over years, over decades, because sometimes they you know first off the individuals may be fa fairly rare. Second, um, they might not reproduce every single year. They might not produce spores every single year. So you got to keep that in mind. Um, and then like, how long are they viable? So from what I understand based on um, from my own previous experience, and this might be totally wrong dependent on what research has come out uh, more recently, but um, spores don't last super, super long. Um, and that, that's because they're they're kind of a they're kind of a short term solution. The, the investment is really in the gametophyte to get to get the business done, so to speak. Uh, angiosperms, you know, uh, tr uh, seed producing plants get around this by producing a seed that can um, you know that has a lot more protection and has a lot more um, nutrients encased inside. So um, you know those kinds of plants. Kind of get around it, but I think, I think ferns, um, they have to, um, they, their spores don't last for very long, is what I'm trying to say. I don't think that they last for super, super long. I may, might be wrong about that, though. We have I a participant. We have a participant, David Hill, um, uh, made a comment that it can vary between four weeks and six months for spores to germinate. So I think it, it might could be dependent on the fern. Thank you so much, David, for sharing that knowledge with us. Yeah, thank you. Sounds like David's gonna uh, is uh, an expert. So I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, so these guys, again, really cool. I haven't personally found gametophytes yet, and that's something that I'm trying to work on, um, see whether I can't do that uh, this year, this season. But our season is about to end because um, February, we get into March and it starts to warm up. Um, it's going to be very hard for gametophytes to be out um, and uh, getting that, that part done. So anyway, I think it also... David also shared that some photosynthetic spores, um, Osmunda, can a lot, only last a couple of days. So I think it, you know it can be varying depending on the type of fern. Thanks again, David, for sharing some of your knowledge with us. Um, that's what I love about these programs. Is we have so many people um, that have so much knowledge all around. <laughs> for sure, that is really cool. Awesome, I really appreciate that. So. We're going to talk about some of the specific ferns that we can find um, in our in our local bay um, here in California, and you might actually find them. Some of them you can find further up north um, through Western Canada and in Alaska, and some of them um, you can also find further south to Southern California, 
um, I just recommend, you know, uh, figure out your local fern society um, and your local native plant society because they're going to have a ton of resources um, for sure. But here we go with the first one. Um, this is probably one of the most iconic that people see or when they think about a fern, they, you know, they think about the Western sword fern. Um, and it's called a sword fern for this little thumb that kind of sticks up from the frond. So as the frond is coming out, it's sticking like up towards the tip of the frond. Um, that thumb kind of looks like uh, the hilt of a sword. And so each of these little uh, pinna coming out, they look like basically little swords coming out of the coming out of the frond. And I apologize, I have a lot of road noise. So if you guys hear that, again, can't really control it. But um, so anyway, the uh, Western sword fern, it's called Polystichum munatum. Um, and it's most commonly found in coastal areas and it really likes acidic soil. So anything, anything carnivorous um, is really your best bet for finding the Western sword fern. They're found in like our, in our redwoods and our dug fir forests. Um, they're really iconic when I, you know, when I think about it, when I think about a redwood forest, I think primordial times, like times before the dinosaurs. And that's essentially, you know, what ferns, you know, when they first came about, they were like here before a lot of what we consider ancient life to be. So really fascinating. Um, they are also identified by fairly large, um, two to six foot long fronds, uh, once divided. So when we say compound, we're talking about, you know, the, the division um, between the leaves. They're once divided dark, shiny leaflets um, that connect to a central midrib. So that's this long stem here. Um, and then they, they alternate so the pinna alternate from the stem here. And um, they have slightly like fuzzy serrated edges. So if you were to touch this, it would feel kind of like fuzzy or hairy to you. Um, the base of the plant is really round and they all come from one spot. Um, we're gonna look at a couple of other ferns that don't do that. They're, um, they're what we call polypodium, which means many footed. But that's the Western sword fern. Um, and this one, this one is my favorite. I actually have uh, a maiden hair fern, uh, Adiantum jordaniae, on my balcony. It's my longest living native plant that I've been able to keep without killing. So um, in terms of hardiness, I'd say they're fairly hardy. Um, I've definitely forgotten to water it a couple of times. And every time I remember it does, it definitely shoots back out some new fronds. So it's a really good fern. Um, it's called maidenhair because of the dark wiry stems. It reminds people of maiden's hair. Um, the Adiantum genus actually comprises a family of 250 species. So it's actually a very, very diverse group um, of ferns that grow throughout um, California. Um, and even I think um, throughout the West actually, through the Western United States. Um, we find this fern everywhere. Um, it's always like a, a real treasure for me when I go for a hike in the wintertime because that's when um, Adiantum is in leaf. And you'll see it through uh, many of our county parks um, in our local open spaces like Rancho Canada del Oro and um, Coyote Valley. Um, and like usually you'll see them along embankments. Um, so like you're walking along a trail and there's an embankment to the left. They really like shaded areas, shaded embankments, um, woodland forests. Uh, they really love our oak woodlands out here. Um, and they can be identified by the leaflets, um, which these leaflets are kind of um, semicircle shaped. They're like a piece of a pie kind of, kind of shape, as you can see here. 
Um, they have little radiating veins coming out of them. Um, and in the, I didn't get a picture of the underside on this one, but um, you, you can see the edges curl underneath that protects the developing sporangia. Um, and up north, uh, the native Pomo actually use the, the maidenhair fern for their very tightly woven black accents on their baskets. Um, in fact, they I think they mainly use the five fingered fern because they generally have a very even look to the stems. So it's really easy to use like a longer strand. Um, with the Jordanii, it's it's a little bit more segmented. Like it looks like this as, as you're looking at the stem of the fern. Um, but a lovely fern. I highly recommend it for your garden if you don't already have one. Um, it's amazing. It's my favorite for sure. Um, and in this one, this one's a really cool one. So when I was talking about ferns, liking wet places, this is one um, that can tolerate dry places. And actually, when I was doing my research for this, I didn't realize, but cliff breaks are found um, throughout the Western United States, if not the world, I think. Um, I was astonished to find like resources like in Colorado and Arizona and all these really high desert places also have cliff breaks. So uh, break um, is like an old English or Welsh term, I'm not sure, that means fern. I didn't know this. Maybe someone can correct me on that, but that's something that I read and I was like, what? Okay, very cool. Um, and so cliff break means the ferns that grow in cliffs. There are two different species that are found in the Bay Area and that includes coffee fern um, and bird's foot cliff break. So these guys are commonly actually found in the dry chaparral, uh, really rocky outcroppings, um, uh, foothill woodlands and grasslands. Um, and when you look at them, like at first, whenever I go hiking out in my, on our trails and stuff, I'd look at them and be like, that's not a fern. It's totally a fern. So they um, kind of have a more leathery leaf to them. It's got a lot more structure, a lot more oomph. Um, and the, the leaf edges curl under a little bit. Um, in order to protect the, the, the sporangia, kind of like with the um, adiantum species. They have very dark green leaflets and widely branching fronds. Um, and they also uh, shed water. Um, they, they're really good at um, uh, shedding water. And when you put water on them, they, the, the droplets form. They don't actually like look wet. Uh, leaves turn, turn darker as they age, and these guys are beautiful um, when they age. They can turn purple and um, like brown color, different shades of uh, rusty red. Um, so they are a really, really lovely fern. Um, and the coffee fern, the way you differentiate like coffee fern versus um, the bird's foot is the tips are rounded um, with a uh, uh, bird's foot cliff break. The leaves are actually, the, the tips of the leaves are more pointed, which is why they get the, the word uh, bird's foot. It's like more pointy. Um, but yeah, this is a really, really fascinating group. And this is a group that I really want to learn more in terms of like how they reproduce sexually, because it seems like they've chosen a really harsh environment to try to do that. Um, but yeah, this is really cool. I'm glad I get to share this with you. Um, Benny, do we have any uh, questions before I move on? I just want to make sure I capture some questions. Before we, we... we do. We have a, a question from Dennis. Um, how large do the cliff breaks get? Not very big. Um, I've usually seen them about, hmm, and I'm thinking about it. The largest ones that I've seen are maybe a foot and a half um, tall, um, maybe not even that. 
and went and for reference foot and a half is oh gosh i can't do this um <laughs> it's maybe half well not even a half a meter um yeah it's it's more like maybe a quarter meter or something like that it's they're not very tall at all they tend to uh stick pretty low to the ground i guess is what i'm saying um and as you can kind of see from this photo, they kind of um, separate out. They try to sprawl a little bit uh, more than they try to grow tall. Um, I have seen some that are like more bushy. They kind of look like a bush for sure. Any other questions? Yes. Um, would the cliff break fern have landscape use um, besides in containers? Oh, for sure. Um, I wouldn't be necessarily a great expert on that, um, but I have seen them used in landscapes, um, especially in rocky areas. Um, if you have like a rocky section or even a really sunny section, um, they're a great fern to keep in a in a fairly sunny section or a semi sunny section of your of your landscape um, because they can tolerate it. Um, some of these other ferns that I'm talking about, um, like the, the woodwardia, I definitely wouldn't grow in sun. Um, maybe some partial sun, like maybe one hour a day kind of thing. It's a really a shady, shade loving plant. Um, the adiantum, I've actually had luck because I grow it in a container. So when I um, don't want it to get scorched, I can bring it in as a house plant in the summertime um which makes it makes a lovely house plant but in terms of the cliff breaks i'd say it can tolerate a lot more sun than can um, some of the other ones that i'm that i'm talking about any other ones i'm going to take we one do. more question before i move on we have mauricio i hope i'm pronouncing that right um given that there are so many ferns in our local forest can you explain how best it is to dig them from local forests and transplant plant in our backyard. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend that unless you have um, the permission, obviously, of the of the landowner or the um, the agency that you're you're doing it with. Like we don't allow that at our preserves because uh, we want to help preserve the local habitat and ferns are a really important part of local ecology. Um, but um, if you are, um, some ferns are going to do better than others. And so if you're, if you have, say, a private landowner and you want to get some ferns and you have their permission and it's all good, like um, some ferns that may be doing better, that, that do better with that, um, include um, the more uh, rhizomatic uh, ferns. So, gosh. I'm actually, I'm, this is a little bit out of my depth because I don't usually think about digging them up. Um, and you'll have to do a little bit of experimentation, but bracken ferns, um, from what I've heard, are actually really easy to propagate using rhizomes. Um, and the majority of these are going to be much better to grow using rhizomes. So digging them up is not going to be that big of a deal, but I'm not sure how well they'll tolerate it. So like the maiden hair might not tolerate it as well as the bracken fern, for instance. So you'll have to do some research and probably find out from a local grower on that account. Um, but yeah, I hope that helps answer it. It's kind of the confusing thing because it's going to be dependent on the species, I think. Yeah, definitely. I think that answered that. We'd love to keep the ones that are growing out in nature in nature, but you might be able to get them from someone's like personal land, not open space, mm -hmm. and um, or not our parks. Uh, we had a question that could you find um, local ferns at your like typical garden store, like um, and the example was Summer Winds Nursery. Yeah, so um, you can find ferns. Um, if you were to walk into like, I mean, our local big box stores, right? You can find a, a Lowell's or a Home Depot or whatever, right? Um, and you can find ferns there. Yeah, that's not going to be difficult, but um, I always think about it from an ethical 
viewpoint, um, many of these big box stores, they're going to be using a lot of pesticides and neonicotinoids, uh, which, um, or yeah, neo, yeah, I, I think I might have gotten that. I'm not sure. They're, um, these are pesticides that have affected our pollinator uh, populations really, really badly. Um, I don't think I used the right word there. Neo, I can write it, but I can't say it. Um, I'll find it and I'll write it in the chat at the end of this. But in any case, you want to be cognizant about uh, what, where you're buying from so that you're not buying plants that have been treated with these kinds of pesticides because these pesticides can last in the local environment in your own backyard for up to eight years. Um, it's pretty, and, it's, and there, there are seeing studies that it does affect local pollinators. So when, you know, we're, we're all worried about the bees, right? We're all worried about the butterflies. So I think it's um, important to think about local growers um, I'm actually going to be sharing a resource at the end of this presentation for Calscape, um, which shows you like where you can find local nurseries in, in say the Bay Area or in California. Um, but you may have a local plant society that uses a similar resource. So I would definitely get in contact with local plant societies um, for that. Uh, so then that way you, you know that you're getting um, you're getting some ethically sourced uh, plants or, you know, native plants or, you know, plants that haven't been treated with pesticides. Yes, and we have had some folks share um, that um, in the chat. Uh, some Victoria said that there's a native plant shop at Highway 92, which is great. Um, Al Al Mad Al <laughs> Valley Nursery has a great section of California native plants and they have a whole section like um, that include ferns. Um, so yeah, so just, um, Tracy was saying we shouldn't take um, ferns from our local parks and yes you want to um, keep the ferns at our local parks alone but you can purchase some and you just want to make sure they're not treated with pesticides and the neonicotinoids that like Kat shared and if you're purchasing them at those native plant um, nurseries you just want to make sure that you ask before buying them and make sure that they're not being treated. Um, great great suggestions from everyone. Yeah. Um, and if, if you're not sure, you know, you can always ask the employee at the store and just say, hey, you know, I'm, you know, a little bit concerned about pesticides. Do you guys treat your plants? And they'll be able to tell you right off the bat. Um, they have to tell you that, actually. Like, I'm pretty sure, you know, if you're concerned about pesticides, they have to tell you. So. We had Den Denise share something that um, she's sharing in the chat, uh, fernshop.com. But she also shared that sometimes um, called the chi the California chain fern. It's a massive fern that's native to California in the Western United States and it's semi drought tolerant. It's planted in the shade and it gets adaptability, adaptability, <laughs> adaptability to drought by an extensive root system. So that's a great native fern. Um, oh, and is a good folks. one. I'll actually be, get to talk about that one too. I'm glad that Denise brought it up because it's a really beautiful one. Very Great. cool. Thank you. Thank you all for that information. Awesome. I'm glad that we're going to get to talk about that because it's a um, it's a part of my slideshow. So this is great. Um, oh, so I, there's another one that's really unpredictable that um, when I was doing my research. So I'll tell you a little bit about my process for doing this program. I was like, what ferns grow around here? Well, I can name a few. What ferns grow around here? I looked at iNaturalist. And iNaturalist actually lists um, mosquito ferns, Azola, as, as a fern. And I was like, what? This is a fern? Like, I didn't know that these things existed. And it's a really cool fern that's actually returned to the water. Um, and we do find it here in the Bay Area. It's considered invasive in some places. It depends on where you're at. Um, but it actually covers the tops of ponds and slow moving waterways. It kind of has this segmented look to it. It's a really strange looking fern. And um, I've actually seen observations near Coyote Creek. So I've been looking for an excuse to get out there and take a look at it and go, you know, observe it, figure out what makes it tick. Um, 
in other parts of the world, uh, especially in Asian countries, it's used as a, a companion plant in rice paddies to help fix nitrogen. Um, and it blocks light from competition from other plants. So and the rice usually pokes up through the water, but this helps to keep anything else from uh, competing with rice. Um, and it's called mosquito fern because apparently because it covers the surface of the water, um, it prevents mosquito larvae from reaching the surface. So it helps to keep populations of mosquitoes down. I'm not sure how accurate that is, but that's why it's in the name. Um, it's identified by this extremely reduced form. Leaflets fold and kind of fold inside of each other, creating this like segmented look to it. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really, really weird. It, it makes you think about like, well, when plants return to the water, they don't really need a whole lot of structures. Um, in fact, this, yeah, so again, it basically has roots and it basically has a few stems and it just has leaves and it floats on the top of the water and it's considered a fern. It still reproduces using those spores and, and all of these other adaptations. And it still has some remnants of vascular tissue. So it's pretty bizarre, pretty fascinating. Do we have a question in the, in the chat? We have just, um, Jen mentioned that she loved using fairy moss, azola in her koi pond because the koi eat it and it keeps algae growth down. Um, and we also have Michael Hawk um, sharing an observation that he uh, made of Azola on iNaturalist. And um, I, if you can share that link on, in the chat for everybody, that would be great. Thank you so much. And we have Rose asking, do the mosquito fern roots extend to the soil or do they just float and absorb nutrients from the water? I think they just float. Um, it, it looks like from this picture and from a se several other pictures that I'd um, I'd seen on INAT that the roots just kind of like float down into the water. They don't really necessarily anchor. Um, and it, it does definitely depend on the species of Azola, I think. Um, this one is kind of a segmented look, but like fairy, I think fairy moss has a different look to it. So definitely one of those weird ones. Um, not something that I considered to be a fern, but you know, this plant group has surprises. So I'm always excited for surprises. I hope you all are. Um, it just makes it a really fascinating plant group. Um, so this one's one, I apologize because the picture is kind of terrible. Um, when I was looking for a good picture of bracken, I wanted something that showed the triangular look to the, to the plant. But um, so brackens, um, the, the ones that we have here, I think, are common bracken and hairy bracken. There might be a couple others that I'm missing. Um, and those are actually found throughout the world. So if you're in England and um, Wales and everywhere else, you're probably going to find bracken fern. Um, and it is considered invasive in certain parts of the world. They're, these two, I believe they are native to California. Um, and so bracken ferns, they're mainly coastal and they're gonna be fine and found in like coastal shaded forests and open hillsides. I, uh, I've i seen like whole hillsides covered in bracken fern up in um, uh, Point Reyes, for instance, uh, in the North Bay. And they're very, very easy to identify based on their very triangular shape. Um, and they're actually triple pinnate. So you have like, the the main frond here and then i believe each like this has a front this is the frond and then each of these is a frond and then like um each of these little leaflets which is hard to see in this photo i changed this out at the last minute so i apologize but they also have like a little bit of a rip so that kind of makes it triple pinnate um and, but it's overall very triangular. Each of the fronds are very triangular. Um, and then the lobes are round and smooth edged. And the plant actually, it stands erect and then it has these branches kind of going out the top. 
So it's, um, it's able to stand up like that because it has these ribs. So when you look at the stem itself, it has, um, you, when you roll it, it kind of has these, um, it doesn't roll smoothly. It has, it has ribs along it. So bracken fiddle necks are considered edible, but beware. Um, there have been announcements by the California State Health Department um, from the 90s that has called bracken fern a carcinogen. And in studies uh, where it has been fed to mice and rats and toads, it has caused tumors. So I've heard of people eating fiddlenecks. I haven't personally eaten fiddlenecks before. I wanna try them. Um, but I believe uh, one that you can eat um, that isn't gonna cause uh, can uh, tumors um, is ostrich fern, which doesn't grow native in California. Um, the, Bracken fern wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Uh, just based on, I'm, I want to keep safe. I want to make sure you guys stay safe. So um, that that had been uh, reported before. Oh yeah, you could totally eat brackens, and actually, I found out that you can't, or you really shouldn't. Um, I'm gonna move on. <gasps> My other favorite. So um, let me geek out about goldback ferns. Um, so goldback ferns are another perennial fern. They, uh, you can find them in the California oak woodlands. They're very common around here. They really do like the, the moist habitats, especially on north facing slopes. Um, and they're super cool. Um, the name is Pentagramma triangularis. Um, and that's because uh, apparently the tips of the fronds, you can um, kind of draw a pentagram uh, from them. Um, and that's where that part of the name comes from. They, uh, they grow primarily from rhizomes um, and the stems are primarily black, brown, and really smooth. They, uh, the bright green, like the, the fronds, um, they're divided into leaflets and the, the leaflets, as you can kind of tell, they, they're, they're a bit like amorphous. Um, they're not gonna be like these perfect spheres, you know, like lobes that come out. They're gonna be more like lobed, weird looking things that doesn't necessarily mirror the other side, um, which I think that makes them like the perfect individualistic, like artistic fern. Um, they're, like I mentioned, these are one of my favorites. Um, and they have a really good adaptation from um, desiccation. For, for one thing, um, they will desiccate if they don't get enough water. I've seen them, you know, late summer and fall, and I'm like, is that a bracken fern? It's all like curled up. Um, it like curls up and it's like trying to protect itself. And it's all black and gray and doesn't really look like much. And then when the water comes out though, they unfurl themselves. Uh, so what they do to help keep themselves from desiccating is they actually have a light yellow exudate on the bottom side of the of the leaf. And this isn't the spores. It's not the spores. It's actually a powder that the plant produces um, to <clears throat> prevent moisture loss. And the fun thing that you can do with goldback ferns I mean, you know, do it with your own, I guess, the ones that you're watering, don't necessarily do this with the ones out in nature, but you can uh, take the fern on a dark pair of trousers and you can make an imprint of the fern using that yellow exudate. Um, again, I, would, I wouldn't necessarily do that from, from the perspective of a land manager and you're like, oh, well, this plant is trying to produce the stuff to keep itself from drying out maybe don't do that, you know, for the ones that are struggling for sure. But um, some people have done that. That's actually how I came to know goldback ferns was someone told me that as a kid and I was like, what? So they're very, very cool. These guys don't get very big. So these are like an accent container type plant if you wanna grow them in, um, at your home, they're more suited for that. Um, you can grow them in the, in the yard, but 
they're they're going not going to get very big. They get like maybe six and in, six inches tall, like very small, very small. Um, but they are the cutest darn ferns. Um, I really love them. Uh, one thing that I did learn about them too is the dusky footed wood rat in our local um, woodlands uh, will eat the fronds of these plants. So it's a part of their part of their diet. Does anybody have any questions about the goldback fern or about, you know, any of the ferns? We did have one question. Um, and this was um, from Stephen. He was wondering if the cinnamon ferns um, grow in California. I, I'm not sure. I don't think so. Uh, I have not heard of it, but I, I did look it up um, just in case and it um, and this is just from an article um, that SF Gates said. Um, so it, it does say that they are one of the hardiest and most adaptable fern species and um, they grow in hardiness zones four through nine. So uh, just, I guess you would have to just look up what zone you're in and um, they just require, they were, they grow best under moderate cool and moist conditions. So um, to just look up your, your, um, your hardiness zone and um, you can kind of see if that works for, for your yard or not. I would say too, um, if you're trying to figure out whether it grows locally as a native plant, um, you can certainly look up cinnamon fern in iNaturalist and mm -hmm. see whether there are observations that crop up in, in California. Um, that's kind of how I've been looking at the range and then I do further research to see if that plant is like an invasive or if it, you know, tends to colonize other places. Um, but that's a, that's a good way of looking at it too, because then yes. you can look at a distribution map. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Thank you for your question, Stephen. Um, also, Elaine um, put the Calscape calscape.com you can always mm -hmm. check there and I will um, add that to the chat and yeah great question Stephen thank you awesome I'm gonna try to wrap up because I just realized we're at 2 30 and I was like whoa an hour goes by so quickly <laughs> um, and I just want to make sure that we we get through the rest of this pretty pretty quickly um so this is actually a really common species. Um, I find this species everywhere. And it, in places where I don't necessarily expect to see ferns so much, um, like I don't expect to see it over in our Diablo range, which is the Eastern mountains along the, the Bay Area. I, I mean, I see most of my ferns in the Santa Cruz mountains, um, but it's, they, you can find them there. You can find the coastal wood fern there. Uh, they, they can be identified using the fronds. They kind of feel tough. So when you're touching them, they're gonna feel kind of rough. Um, leaflets often have these tooth bristly tips. And uh, the segments, like the, the different pinna, um, they turn a little bit. So when you're trying to like look at it head on, it's gonna, then it's not going to look flat the way uh, bracken fern is going to look. Uh, the sori are also, when you like look at it in its mature state, they're going to be horseshoe shaped. Uh, dryo means oak, terrace means fern. So it really makes sense that this is a really common oak woodland species. And I've seen this at Sierra Vista, at Alum Rock Park, at Rancho Canada del Oro, at Joseph D. Grant Park. I find this plant everywhere. So if you're a California native, this is probably one of those ones that you're gonna, you're definitely gonna find. Um, I'm gonna keep moving because I wanna get to the end of this. So then that way we can gather some more questions. So I'm just gonna try to keep rolling, hold your questions. We'll, we'll try to get to the end. Um, this is Denise's one. This one's uh, uh, the giant chain fern and they're very easy to identify. Uh, the ferns are, the fronds are flat. They're also huge, like huge. They can be over six feet, six feet long, the fronds are. Um, and the really easy way of identifying them is you look on the underside, the sori are gonna be in these long chain like formations along the, um, the leaf edges. 
they're really beautiful. As you can see, like they have these very geometric looking lobes that are pointed. Um, and they really like the coastal areas. They love lots of fog, shade, and moisture. Um, and this one in particular, this was uh, found by uh, one, of my, one of my previous colleagues at Uvis Canyon County Park. So uh, they are still found in the South Bay, uh, not, not something that I would have expected. California polypody. Um, so this is a, a fern that we, we call it polypody because it's many footed, uh, means many feet. And uh, unlike some of the other ferns that we've talked about, this actually grows along a rhizome like in a line. So you have fronds that come out in a line rather than at one singular point. Um, they get to a height of about two feet. Um, they have distinctive, distinctive long, undivided, wavy fingers. They look really ruffled on site. And then when the um, sori are actually uh, mature, they look huge on the underside of the leaf. Um, I love this picture that I saw on iNaturalist where you could really see the sporangia along the underside there. And when you're looking at it from the top, Oftentimes you can see the sporangia from the top because it provides these indentations. They look beaded from the top. They look really cool. Um, this one is one that I have seen growing on rocks, like literal boulders. Where I'm like, how did you, how did you get there? Um, they'll also uh, grow on logs and trees. And um, they're another really lovely lovely fern and they're very they're these ones are also fairly drought drought tolerant um they like to grow in drier areas and as a subspecies of that is the licorice fern so i had to add this one because i am a big fan of licorice um i like um like black jelly beans i like the anise taste um <clears throat> So these guys grow in trees, um, mossy trunks and rocks, um, and they can grow as an epiphyte. So that means basically growing on air. And uh, they, they're called licorice fern for the smell that occurs when they when you break the roots open. So they smell like licorice. Um, according to some sources that I read, the roots were used by indigenous peoples as a sweetener. And they can be found on mossy logs or along streams, often with the big leaf maples. Uh, and it's another polypody fern. They're generally a lot bigger. And these guys you can find all the way up to Alaska. So if you live on the West Coast um, along Washington and Oregon, you are definitely going to find licorice fern. Um, and apparently you can find them in Santa Cruz. So I definitely have to take a look there. But um, as I mentioned before with the polypody, you can see the sori from the top. Isn't that so cool? It's got this like beaded pattern along the leaflets. And there are many others. So there are definitely a lot of ferns that I didn't cover. Um, there's lady fern and lace fern and deer fern and lip fern and leather ferns. Um, and I wanted to, uh, first off, um, give you guys a couple of tips for best practices. So get yourself on like iNaturalist, for instance, for identifying ferns. It's really going to be helpful. Look at leaf growth patterns, the shape of the sori. Um, look for them in cool, moist areas, but also in other areas where you might not expect them, like the chaparral. Um, and then remember that there are gametophytes, which are really cool. I haven't found one yet, but you know it's going to be really precious if you get to find one because they're very hard to find. Um, and uh, this is the part that I wanted to get to because I know that you guys had a lot of questions. So um, in terms of finding ferns, um, I'd highly recommend uh, if you're living in California, go to CalScape. So I believe one of our participants mentioned that. And I apologize because I'm not looking at the chat, but um, 
is a great resource because you can literally uh, go to nurseries. You have a map and uh, you can definitely take a look at what's near you. But you can also, so I don't know if I can do this. Let me, I'm going to unshare my screen real quick. I'm going to unshare. I also I shared I... the link on the, in the chat. So okay. if folks want to, they can click on that link and it should open it up for them as well. I'm going to actually end my slideshow and I'm going to go to that link if I can find it. But where is the link? If you go to the chat, it should be there for you. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking. USDA, Calscape Nurseries. Oh, wait. Where did it go? Oh, there we go. Is my screen still showing? It is only showing the. Um, the PowerPoint. Okay, so. so let me, gosh, how do I end share screen? New share, there we go. Okay, so what is really cool about this website is you can search. So can you guys see this? Yes, we see this now. Okay, um, you can actually do a search. So like um, maiden hair fern. And um, this is Southern Maiden Hair Fern. So this is actually uh, gonna be found more in Southern California, but um, you can go to the plant and you can find nurseries that carry that plant. So, um, you know, if you want a specific species, this is a great place to, to do that. Um, and unfortunately, I don't necessarily have resources for folks, you know, who live in other parts of the country or, or around the world. But again, I highly recommend find your local native plant society. If you have an, um, like a, a fern society, like we have the American Fern Society, go to them. Um, they will definitely have resources for finding these. Um, I'm, a little, I'm a little over time, but I'm gonna uh, spend the next five minutes or so and take some questions from folks. Um, Oh, David Hill, he mentions uh, the San Francisco Fern Society is a probably good source um, for ferns and advice. Thank you, David. Um, and we have one question in the Q&A if you'd like to check that out, Kat. Okay, let's see. Why is dry, dryopterus uh, called a wood fern? So um, I might have I might have answered this, but I, I so the dryopterus, dryo means oak, and um, terrace means uh, fern. Um, so it's it's primarily associated with uh, like oak woodlands. So it might be you know it's called a wood fern, coastal wood fern. People just generally tend to assume okay oak, oak wood. So that's the way I would probably think about it. It's probably not the best. You enjoyed my lecture. Oh, I don't actually have a whole lot of lectures on YouTube, but um, I'll, I'll take that back. I probably have quite a few by now, but um, the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, we actually share all of our programs um, on YouTube. So if you search us on YouTube, um, you will find the whole library of, um, of programs that we have. And I haven't done all of them. But uh, Betty has done some amazing ones. Like I think Betty recently did one last, like maybe last year on uh, wildlife camera footage, which is really cool. Um, gosh, I can't even recall like how many how many that we've done at this point. We've done a lot of programs virtually. I now, did share the know. I did share the YouTube channel. Um, in the chat so if folks want to click on that and just have it um, as a resource for the future and we can kind of go through there and and see what programs might interest you there their programs there from various various like going back um, a couple years as well which is great and then dennis just shared that the theater pain foundation in sun valley um, grow native nursery in claremont at the botanical uh, california botanical gardens are great resources for folks in um, southern california um, oh, very cool. Yeah. And uh, David McKinter um, just uh, asked another one. Can we plant ferns in our San Jose backyards? For sure. 
Um, there are a couple of species that um, I recommend. It depends on which, it depends on what your backyard is like. If you have a really shaded backyard, then you have a lot of opportunities for ferns. If you don't have a whole lot of shade, say you have a really sunny backyard, there's a few species that'll do pretty okay, depending on where you plant them and depending on how much water you give them too. Because um, like I mentioned, the majority of these species are very water dependent. Um, even though they're drought tolerant, they're water dependent. So especially for reproduction and stuff, um, and some of them just really like having wet conditions. So like your woodwardia and your, uh, um, your western sword fern, for instance, those are going to be like a lot more on the wet side. But if you want, oh yeah, big yuke trees. Yeah, ferns will be, be great. Um, one thing, uh, you know, if you have a sunny backyard, the uh, palea, the, the coffee fern, is a stunning addition to a backyard. It just has the best colors. So I would highly recommend that. Um, Cynthia Denny, best ferns for your yards. Well, I mentioned quite a few. So the Woodwardia, the Western Sword Fern, the um, Adiantum, the, the Maidenhair Fern is something that I really love growing. Um, and then, uh, you know, depending on what you want it to do uh, to accent things in your backyard. Awesome. Do I have any other questions? I don't see any more. Ooh, that sounds like a great idea. I'm not sure about lavender. I think lavender requires a little bit more sun, but um, you can always try it and definitely get some advice um, from a landscaper because I'm not a landscaper. I just like to grow plants and see what works. So it's very cool. I really enjoyed having everyone um, join us for this presentation. And I really appreciate Betty. Thank you so much for helping uh, to manage the chat and the That's questions awesome. and everything. Um, again, if you guys have any questions, I believe Betty has shared my, my email in the chat and I can share it again. I'm typing it in right now. So um, awesome. And uh, otherwise, um, I hope you guys all have a great rest of your Friday. Um,